Paul, thank you very much for for doing this. You are all over the news now uh, <laughs> with this uh, with this paper on uh, phosphine gas in the clouds decks of uh, Venus. Yeah. People are saying, oh, maybe there is life on Venus. Well, what's the story, man? Can you give me a brief overview of this uh, paper? Sure. So uh, the main thing that's been found in the paper is that uh, a particular uh, spectroscopic feature was found in the atmosphere of Venus around one millimeter wavelength. And it was found with two different instruments, the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope and ALMA. And this was observed by Jane Greaves. And the only explanation that we've been able to find for this feature of all the known molecules with known features around there, the only one that explains this feature is phosphine. And phosphine is a molecule composed of one phosphorus atom and three hydrogen atoms. This one. That's the one. And by all rights, just uh, let's uh, let's uh, specify that uh, the molecule doesn't look like that. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> although I've been really really interested in when uh when people do these sorts of microscopy studies and they see what molecules like benzene rings look like, they look surprisingly like the ball and stick models actually. Um I will admit it doesn't look exactly like that, but it would certainly have a sort of electron cloud in a certain yeah. area and three yeah. other electron clouds, and there'd be a little bit of space between them. And if you looked at this uh, with the right kind of microscopy, it would look surprisingly like that yeah. picture. Yeah. Okay, so we've seen all this news, uh, so sort of clickbait uh, news. Uh, this one, for example, signs of alien life detected on Venus, or <laughs> this other one, forget Mars. Scientists oh. find the sign of life on Venus. <laughs> What do you think about this uh, clickbait uh, news? I definitely understand why it exists, because people want to make money, and uh, this is a good way to get people to click. Like you say, it is clickbait. Um, I think that it does have something in common with uh, fake political news um, in terms of uh, saying something outlandish so that people will click, so that money is gained, uh, so that particular algorithms happen to be satisfied, so that more people see a particular uh, uh, news articles. Um, and I do think that it's damaging to science. I think it's damaging to the search for truth in general, though, actually. I think that it's important that scientific papers report what they see. It's fine to speculate if there's a basis for that speculation, but it's important to be clear about what the evidence actually is, what the speculation is, and how those two are related, and what predictions can be made to really test these speculations. Because the thing is uh, that if a scientist sees this, you will probably understand that there is some exaggeration that's probably uh, a title just to grab the attention, but if you take an average person, maybe you might think, well, actually scientists found life on Venus, yeah. or on Mars, if yeah. you remember the... I think there was something about methane on Mars, and people were speculating that that could be a biomarker. Yep, I've I've done some research on methane on Mars as okay. well, actually. <laughs> so okay. yeah, um, there are alternative ways to make methane. Um, Ren Yu Hu has a wonderful paper where he comes up with five different ways, only one of which happens to be life. This is a very similar sort of story, except that it's earlier on. So that right now there is no known explanation for the phosphine besides life that would produce it in the quantities needed. But that's just because there's a lot less that's known about phosphine than methane. I would imagine that there will be alternatives at some point in time once people really have the chance to seriously study it in this kind of environment. So there are actually more people studying methane than phosphine. Oh, yes. And for, for obvious reasons, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> methane is... Uh, more prevalent. It's been considered a biosignature for a lot longer, and it's a lot safer to work with. Phosphine yeah. is incredibly lethal, and it's explosive. Um, it's not a fun thing to work with. But there are also positive aspects in this uh, clickbait news, because, I mean, if you do this sort of uh, news, if the news spreads, then that might reach uh, policymakers, politicians, and uh, that can help with the allocation of funds for this specific research. Maybe it can reach some... Uh, uh, philanthropist. Oh, yeah. So th the way that I would respond to that is if the news is, is reported honestly, then I think that that can be very useful. If the, re if the news is reported dishonestly, then I th think it can be kind of like a poison apple in the sense of if you say that you find life somewhere or that you could find life somewhere, and then you finally check and you're not careful and then you don't find it, 
it feels very much like scientists are lying. And this, I think, is damaging in two ways. One is it's going to get rid of further funding to search for interesting things on Venus or wherever else you happen to be searching. But it's also damaging because there's really well-established science, science that's not at the beginning of the story, but established further along in the story, like climate science. And so people say, well, look, scientists don't know what they're talking about with phosphine on Venus. Scientists don't know what they're talking about with uh, global climate change. You don't want to equate those two. And there's a risk that that happens when people say such confident and definitive things in titles of articles. And this is especially damaging if politicians or philanthropists happen to read this, happen to believe it, and then happen to be disillusioned by it. Yeah, hopefully we won't get uh, the same sort of uh, polarization. You're going to get one party <laughs> that is going to be for Mars and the other one for Venus. <laughs> <laughs> same way it happens with climate change. Yeah, no, I, I certainly hope that that doesn't happen. Ideally, both should be pursued because both can answer very different questions. There are some really important questions that can only be answered on Mars that just cannot be answered on Venus and vice versa. Yeah, it's very different. Uh, it's a different, very different atmosphere, right? It's a, it's a different atmosphere and it's a different surface. We don't know as much about the surface of Venus because it's so hostile. But there is some evidence that it was resurfaced relatively recently, meaning only in the last 600 million years. Very important to understand how um, volcanic or magmatic processes might work, but very frustrating if you want to find out what early Venus was like. It's all been erased. Whereas with Mars, since it doesn't have the tectonic activity, you can go right back to almost its formation. So that's probably what's the impression <laughs> that uh, most people have about this, uh, <laughs> this uh, discovery. <laughs> See, the other thing I noticed is that I saw the press conference by the Royal Astronomical Society and I was wondering why it was uh, it looked so rushed. Uh, <laughs> it was some sort of uh, improvised. Uh, is there any particular reason for that? I would imagine that that's a combination of a couple things. One is uh, we wanted to be careful not to have the story leak. We know how that worked out, but uh, the goal was not to have the story leaked. And so we didn't disclose it to um, even journalists until about a week before, except for a select few. Sky at Night got advance notice, and they put together a very professional production. One of our concerns is that we didn't want to compete with interest with the Mars 2020. The journalists and the sort of, um, uh, the sort of wider media wasn't informed about this until a week in advance. And the Royal Astronomical Society is a wonderful society for astronomy. Um, I, I don't think that they've had quite as much experience putting together these kinds of media events, especially in light of COVID. I think that's another reason why this looks the way that it does. This would have looked very, very different, I think. If it hadn't been for COVID, they would have all been in the same room. There probably would have been more, more professional equipment to, to record them. Uh, I, I think that it would have looked very, very different if it hadn't have been for the pandemic. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's an illustration I saw from uh, Sarah's uh, presentation where she talks about the various uh, speculations about how life could uh, look like on uh, Venus. Um, so I was reading a book by an author, a British author, that uh, talks about the danger of presenting these sort of illustrations because they are kind of deceptive. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Do you think we should stick to what we know exactly or we should uh, imagine a little bit so that people get inspired? But then, of course, we know what are the dangers. And the yeah. same thing happens also with the, the way that uh, exoplanets are de depicted. I mean, I know that those are illustrations. Yes. But do the public know about that? Sometimes not. Uh, there is a risk about this. I'm going to risk contradicting myself. I think in this case, actually, it's good to have these artistic representations, partially because I think that it's important to have this integration of science and art. Art is a very important human expression as a science. And I think that there's something very human about seeing something new and then trying to draw it and even allowing our imaginations into that. I think it's important to understand that a lot of this will be imaginative, that, that this is limited by our own human experience and that what's there is probably even stranger, more wild than what we could imagine. Um, that's not always well expressed. I think that certain artistic illustrations are very useful if they show something about the mechanism. And in this case, I think that the artistic representation is quite useful because it's showing what would be needed for a life to exist in uh, droplets of pure sulfuric acid or 90% sulfuric acid. And that's why you need the bubble, yes. protective bubble, right? Yeah. And so talking about why life needs this impermeable or near impermeable membrane is one thing. Demonstrating it using sulfuric acid is another, which I think is a useful demonstration. Um, but 
I think that sometimes people won't have the right picture in their head unless they see something like this artistic representation, which may not be accurate to if there's life there at all, does it really look like that? But it does represent one of the important mechanisms in a way that can be grasped by the imagination and therefore better understood. Yeah, I've seen a bunch of videos where they put uh, uh, the sulfuric acid uh, on sugar. Yes. And you see what happens, it gets becomes carbon immediately. No, oh, not yeah. immediately, it takes a bit, but... Uh, it takes a little bit of time, but you make yeah. the sort of worm and then you see the steam yeah, coming yeah. off and, yeah. Yeah, I asked before, what was the sort of review process? How was the paper received by the reviewers? Did you get any nasty reviewers or they oh. were all positive or what, what happened? They were all positive about the implications of this research. They saw that if this was correct, this would have some fairly wide-ranging implications for strange chemistry on Venus. Um, one of the reviewers was Kevin Zonley. Uh, uh, it's a disclosed reviewer. It's mentioned in, um, I believe, in the acknowledgments. He's a very well-established photochemist, and he's known to be very skeptical about biosignatures. Uh, he's published quite a bit about... Uh, why he he doesn't buy methane being on Mars even. Um, and he was also skeptical about our results, but he thought that our paper was uh, presented carefully and that it was worth putting out there into the literature so that people could test this and maybe refute it. There were some antecedents oh, yes. uh, to this paper. So while this paper was being prepared or while you guys were working on it, uh, there were a series of papers uh, led by Sarah and this is one of them where they hypothesize, uh, they try to think about how life could be on uh, on Venus. And uh, so was this planned or like, uh, I mean, they already knew that they were going to publish this and then they were working on these uh, oh, yeah. papers. This is, uh, this would be priming the community a little bit. This is answering. Preparing them. Yeah. Well, okay. because there are a lot of serious questions about if you want to claim that life is even a possibility, there are a lot of things that you want to answer. And so you want to prepare the community for what it is that you're going to be talking about. When this paper w was accepted, and actually even when it was su submitted, the, uh, the observation on Venus had already been made for, for quite some time. Yeah, because this is August and then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So oh, the yeah. second measurement was done in 2019, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. With Alma, right? Yeah, April or May. Yeah. I don't quite recall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about yourself. Sure. I checked your website. <laughs> great website. Oh, uh, thanks. Do you offer services for website design? <laughs> I, I can explain how I produce this, which yeah. is uh, HTML5 has a wonderful suite where you can select different kinds of templates. And so I chose a template off of HTML5, and it's very, very easy to program in HTML if you've had any if you've had any programming experience. Um, in fact, you you can see the HTML5 yeah. up at the bottom. Um, you can choose one of the templates. I modified this template somewhat so it looked a little bit more original, and uh, then added information. Is it faster than uh, Word, WordPress? Uh, I don't particularly like WordPress just because I have more trouble formatting it. Uh, HTML5 is completely flexible, so if I want to spend enough time, I can make it look any way that I like. Whereas yeah. with WordPress, it's very annoying to change it past a certain kind of template. And uh, so what do you do? What's your, uh, what's your research about? So if I look at my website, I'm apparently a naturalist, an astrochemist, and a Cambridge postdoc, and I'm asking the question, are the principles of life, origin, and evolution universal? And my main interest is in that deep question of how life originated, could it have only originated one way, and can looking at other planets and even exoplanets help us to test origin scenarios? Because one of the problems with origins of life is it is somewhat philosophical and speculative, uh, largely because we have a sample size of one, and it's very, very hard to test based on a sample size of one. One of the opportunities that finding life on other planets or exoplanets has is looking at how that life is distributed and perhaps setting up tests for which scenarios are more plausible and which are less plausible. I think the laboratory is another important way to test this more immediately, but it's a limited test because you might need a lot of time for the chemistry to really work out to make life as we know it. And uh, exoplanets will be laboratories where that time has been taken. And uh, how did you get involved in this uh, work on Venus? It's a really funny story, actually. So I had published um, the uh, abiogenesis zone paper uh, in 2018. And this is a paper talking about 
using the light from other stars. This paper. Yes. I yes. love this paper. Oh, thanks. I was going to talk about that. <laughs> it's definitely one of my favorite papers and involves working with some of my some of my favorite scientists. So we spoke scientists. about this paper uh, when we did the interview with Professor Didier Kelo. Uh, yeah. One of the questions was about uh, this paper. And I think this work is amazing because of what you're doing there is that you're looking at uh, the effects of uh, UV light in the synthesis of uh, precursors to RNA, right? Yes. The nucleotides that ultimately would make up RNA, two out of the four of them can be formed this way. The other two can be formed as deoxyribonucleotides, and, there, and we will have a paper out soon showing that this works under realistic uh, UV conditions. Okay. And that's uh, the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, in your paper, basically, you talk about uh, abiogenesis uh, zone. Yes. And habitable zone. Probably people are familiar with the habitable zone, uh, which is the, the, the region in space where we can have liquid water, right? Yes. But the, what's this uh, abiogenesis zone? What, what's that? So that's the zone where you have enough ultraviolet light from the quiescent or quiet emission of the star. So when the star isn't being active or flaring, there's enough UV light to drive forward certain prebiotic photochemical reactions that build all of the main categories of life's building blocks. It builds uh, uh, amino acids, which make up the proteins, uh, which help to catalyze reactions in the cell. It builds phospholipids, which make vesicles, which uh, make simple membranes, which can hold the cell together. And it also makes these informational polymers, um, or at least it makes the building blocks of those, informa of those informational polymers, uh, DNA and RNA. You have a figure in your paper that shows this uh, it sh this one, right? Yes. Which we showed in the interview as well. Yep. This was in the interview. We concentrated on the RNA pyrimidine nucleotides, and we specifically concentrated on two of the very early reactions, partially because the later reactions are harder to set up, but they occur over about the same time scale. And so the assumption, uh, which we have now actually tested in a forthcoming paper, is that these early reactions will run at about the same rate as later reactions. And specifically, we looked at two sources of electrons because the way that this works is you have particular molecules that end up dissolving in the water. And when they dissolve in the water, they become anions, so they have negative charges. And the UV light will knock electrons off of those anions, and those electrons will go and they will attach themselves specifically onto the hydrogen cyanide and will reduce the hydrogen cyanide and will allow for further chemical reactions that form simple sugars. And then from there, depending on what else you have around, they either go in the direction of forming the RNA nucleotides, or they can go in other directions to form proteins or other directions to form the phospholipids. How does the setup look like? You have what, a vial with the, some chemical components and then you, what, you increase the temperature or you just put the UV light, what do you do? Well, the UV light actually ends up increasing the temperature. In this case, you'll notice yeah. that it says 254 nanometers. That's produced by a low pressure mercury arc lamp, or actually it's produced by 16 of them which are arrayed in this, uh, in this cylinder. You put the sample into the cylinder, you turn on the light, you wait a couple hours, or actually in the case of the first reaction, you wait about 30 minutes, and you end up forming this um, amino methane sulfonate, which goes on to form glycine nitrile and glycolonitrile. And glycolonitrile um, will uh, uh, further go on to form uh, glycolaldehyde uh, in the presence of UV light, and in this case, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, we don't have to use hydrogen sulfide in that step, but we wanted to look at both hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dio uh, um, and bisulfite uh, to see which one worked better. And it turns out that bisulfite works much, much better, this SO3 2 minus. It's more prebiotically plausible, and it's much, much faster with the chemistry, which is very important. The hydrogen sulfide is too slow even to work on Earth. So all these things, they happen in a relatively simple setup. So you just start from the ingredient, you put a UV light, and that's it. And yeah. then you wait. Yes. Uh, in this case, we do add a couple of extra things. Uh, one of the important ones is uh, uh, phosphate. And phosphate is important for later reactions because phosphates are incorporated into the backbone of... RNA and DNA, but they are also important as pH buffers. They control the acidity of the solution, which helps to control the reaction, and they are also chemical buffers. It turns out that there are a lot of side reactions that can happen in the setup. You, you produce a lot of other products 
uh, phosphates are really amazing for uh, cleaning up those sorts of products and allowing you with very, very high and selective yields of what you're actually interested in. Where do you think we have these kind of conditions? That's a wonderful question. And the honest answer is I don't exactly know. I know of some candidate uh, environments. So the one which was looked at in a lot of the uh, in, in a lot of the precursor papers that found out about this chemistry before we actually tested it. This looked at an impactor that would come in. Uh, Im impacts would generate a lot of hydrogen cyanide and they would expose a lot of iron. The iron would react with the hydrogen cyanide uh, to form these uh, ferrocyanides. And so in this impact crater, you would form these organometallic complexes and they will complexify with various salts and other things that happen to be around there to form all of the precursors that you need for this sort of chemistry. And then the idea is that you would have it rain afterward and the little streams that would form would form in different regions, do the different chemistries, and then the streams would join and the proteins or the amino acids would meet with the nucleotides and um, ev everything would mix and start to interact with each other. Uh, there are other scenarios that can do this as well, but that's that I think is one of the best investigated. We can make the building blocks of RNA. How far are we to get RNA? So to get to RNA, actually, probably not all that far. If you want to talk about um, short oligomers, uh, say two or three of these uh, building blocks hooked together, because it turns out that this chemistry also produces uh, imidazoles, which are these rings that have carbons, nitrogens, oxygens, and then various other end members. These particular species um, actually help to activate these nucleotides and allow them to oligomerize. They allow them to hook up without having enzymes. And there's a very nice paper that's been accepted in, uh, in Nature Chemistry um, in which uh, uh, Z-Way, uh, the first author, and, the, and a lot of the rest of John Sutherland's group investigate the ways in which that particular molecule can help to activate the amino acids, the nucleotides, and the phospholipids. How far are we from building a ribosome? That is much farther away, and that starts to extend beyond John Sutherland's work into work by people like uh, Jerry Joyce, Jack Shostak, um, that sort of work. There's still a lot of uh, pieces missing. Um, and even once you get there, it's still a huge chasm to getting to even a self-replicating, evolving protocell. Uh, and the sort of interesting thing about the research is it's, it's very much like going on a mountain hike. You think you've gotten to the peak, but then you find out that the peak is much, much farther away. So the farther we go, the larger the landscape becomes and the farther we see we need to go. But there are also people working on alternatives of uh, DNA. I saw some papers from uh, DLMB, mm -hmm. people working on uh, XNA. Yes, you were, you were probably talking about Phil Holliger's group. This yeah. 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 <laughs> um, he's published quite a bit. Um, he used to work pretty closely with uh, Jerry Joyce. Um, and he's done excellent work in origins, um, also looking into alternatives to DNA and RNA. The more that you know, the more that you have your path laid out, the more confident you can be about what the best ways are to get where you want to go. But since we haven't even gotten where we want to go, it's very open as to which path you should take. And my sort of philosophy is I am most confident about a particular path, but this is for largely philosophical reasons or even emotional reasons, not so much for scientific reasons, but there's so much to explore. I might as well stick with my philosophical and emotional reasons and I'll explore what I explore and other people with different sort of inclinations will explore what they explore and we should be able to talk with each other and get along with each other and then figure out ways to test which of these are the better ways to go or the worst ways to go once we get far enough. So there are people that uh, think that uh, other life forms, uh, if in case there are other life forms outside our planet, would be based on DNA. Other people think that uh, they might be based on some other, uh, some some other thing like this XNA or some something different. Yeah. Well, we don't know. We cannot possibly know, right? Yeah, and but nothing says that it should be just DNA, right? Yes. So, um, there are sort of two conservative kinds of variations that you can do. And then there are more uh, progressive sort of variations that you can do. The conservative variations are exactly like this. XNA means that you're changing the sugar. So a nucleotide is made up of the phosphate, the sugar, 
and the nuclear base. You can change the kind of sugar. So RNA and DNA depend on these hydroxyl groups at the very end of, uh, of the bottom of the ribose. Um, but you can change those. And one of the ways that you can do this is you end up with a structure like this. And this is RNA. Okay. And one of the things that you can do is, and I don't remember which one of these you end up removing, but you can remove one of these and that becomes DNA. It's the deoxyribonucleic acid. And then you have this and then you have your base here. And the two things that you can do is you can change this to a different kind of sugar. Or the other conservative thing that you can do is you can change this to a different base. Um, for DNA, the U can also be a T. This is for RNA. This is for DNA. There, there are extra complexities for people who really work in, bi in biology. It's not quite as simple as this, but this is the sort of framework. But there are other bases that you can put here, including bases that life doesn't even use. So you can change the sort of end member groups. This either looks as a single ring, a pyrimidine, or uh, two rings, a purine. Um, but you can change the end members or the moieties, the chemical groups at the ends of these sorts of things into things that um, life doesn't even use. You can actually come up with alternatives here, and you can also come up with alternatives to the sugar. So far, nothing works quite as well as what we have, but one of the arguments you could run is maybe chemically it's easier to form something different than this. And then by natural selection, what we end up with, it, because it, it just works better, um, eventually ends up being selected for. And so the, the sort of chemical changes happen because of a natural selection. Yeah. Or just because of randomness. Uh, the, those... Those, those are the three sort of options that people seriously pursue is you start with one sort of chemical system and we end up with what we have in modern life either because of just random accident or because of chemical necessity or because of natural selection. That it turns out that chemistry favors forming one sort of thing, but then natural selection transforms that to something else. And I mentioned that these are the conservative things that you can do. There are more progressive things that you can do. Uh, Nick Hudd is one person who works on some more progressive ideas about this. Jack Shostak also has, where instead of having this sort of system, you find other things okay. um, that bond in entirely different ways, but that can also contain information. Okay. Oh, that's an interesting sound. Uh, I initially had that camera there, but then I said, if that camera falls down, then it's a problem because it's going to break your head. If it breaks my head, it's fine. I don't oh, care. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I had it there initially. I see. i tell you something about this uh, paper. No, not this one. The previous one we were talking about, your paper. <laughs> I, was, I don't know uh, anything about the I other I was <laughs> talking to some uh, collaborators and uh, I told them I would really like to interview the guy that wrote this paper. But then I didn't realize that it was you. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't remember your name. And then I found out that, and then I told you, do you want to you wanna do a podcast with me about the Venus paper? And then I said, oh, that's the guy that wrote this paper. And this actually does fit into the Venus story, um, amusingly. Okay. Uh, more, more into the history of it. Uh, I would say that the science in this is not all that relevant to whatever is happening on Venus right now. But I was uh, giving a talk about these results at Imperial College in London. And uh, one of the attendees um, uh, happened to raise his hand. He introduced himself as Dave Clements. I'd never met him before. And uh, he asked, uh, do you know anything about biosignatures? And I said, well, not so much. I know a little bit. And he says, do you know anything about the chemistry of biosignatures? And I said, well, for some of the biosignatures, yes, I do photochemistry, and so I know a bit about them. And so he said, what about phosphine? You just said, what about phosphine? Yeah, and I said, well, I don't know a lot about phosphine, but I know someone who does. Um, uh, Clara Souza Silva from MIT. Uh, she was at University of College London pretty relatively recently, uh, but she had gone to MIT, and she had specifically worked on phosphine as a biosignature. That's the person you'd want to talk with. She knows the most about the chemistry of it, and she knows the most about the spectroscopy of it. He approached me later af after the talk and said, well, the reason I'm asking about phosphine is we found it on Venus. And I didn't believe him because I know enough about the photochemistry. I had not really studied phosphine much, but I know what phosphine looks like. And I know enough about the photochemistry to know that uh, it shouldn't be on Venus. I kind of assumed Venus would be like Earth in this case. Venus is relatively oxidized. Earth is relatively oxidized. 
it has a lifetime on Earth that's so short that it's all gone within one kilometer height. And so it just really shouldn't be there. Um, so I dismissed it. Um, Did he ask you to sign an NDA before I tell? <laughs> no. Uh, I tell anyone. So actually, both Jane Greaves and Dave Clements were really open about this. Okay. Um, because no one was really paying attention. Lots of people got to hear about this, but no one was taking it seriously. And by no one, I mean including myself at, at that stage. Um, but I did say that I would introduce him to Clara. And I think Clara, even initially, um, with the first couple emails, was pretty dismissive. She said, oh, yeah, I'll send you some of the stuff that I'm working on, uh, and you can look at that. Then I got back to Cambridge, and it turns out Jane Greaves had a visiting professorship uh, at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. So we ran into each other, and she had been included in some of these emails, and she sat down with me and showed me the data that she had okay. from the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope. And when I saw the data, I got more excited because this looked like a pretty good detection. And Jane's a very careful scientist. And so if she was confident, I was more confident. And we got more excited. We started talking so loudly in the common room, in fact, that uh, a few of the members of Cavendish Labs got to learn early about the, uh, <laughs> the detection of phosphine on Venus. Um, and... What I did was I emailed Clara back with some of those results with Jane C. Seed. Clara got a lot more excited and involved Sarah Seeger. And um, Sarah Seeger proposed um, uh, submitting for time with Alma. And Jane said, well, I've already done that a few times and I keep getting rejected. But we were pretty sure we could send a much better application now for two reasons. One is um, we had a theoretical basis we started looking at the stability of phosphine in Venus. It's much more stable on Venus than on Earth because on Earth you have a lot of water vapor and water vapor makes a lot of hydroxyl radicals which are very efficient at destroying phosphine. And it's one of the reasons why you tend to have these parts per trillion amounts that end up getting completely annihilated within a kilometer. Whereas on Venus, these part per billion amounts which were being suggested by some of the results um, uh, by, the, by the JCMT measurement um, made sense. And so we could argue that it made sense. And it, uh, additionally, Jane had her data now and could show that to Alma. We got a response very quickly um, within a couple of weeks, which is uh, normally you have to wait months for these applications. But we got a response in a couple of weeks saying, I think we can see Venus um, within a couple of weeks. And they did. They got the data. The data was very difficult to reduce. So it took months before we finally knew that phosphine had been seen with Alma. When, once that was known, I went out for drinks with my wife. And I can barely remember even where we went or what we talked about because it just felt <laughs> otherworldly. Okay. Yeah. And then what happened? Um, well, so once we saw it, that's when uh, the astrobiologists really went to work. Janusz Patowski um, and William Baines, both of them are top-notch astrobiologists. They had done some work on the astrobiology um, connected with with phosphine. And along with Sukrit Ranjan um, and myself, uh, both of us are photochemists, uh, we really started to look at the alternative ways to produce phosphine on Venus. And we looked at a lot of alternatives. Um, it ended up becoming a 100-page paper that uh, we attempted to get accepted at a certain journal. I, I won't name the journal, but the journal rejected it because it was too long. Um, 100 pages. Yes, and that 100-page paper is accessible. You can get it off of archive, and it basically goes through all the ways that we looked into forming this. And it turns out that any known abiotic production that we could find in the literature anywhere was not sufficient to form the amount of phosphine that was observed. So basically, these results are just mentioned, uh, simply mentioned in this graph, right? Which is from yeah. the extended figure uh, 10. Yep. So basically, on Earth, we have... Uh, two ways of producing phosphine, right? So one is the industrial and the other one is from microorganisms. Yep. Uh, so it's microbes in, an, in an anoxic environments. And I won't get much more specific for two reasons. One is I am not a biologist. I don't have a biology background. The other reason is I've talked with the biologists and they don't know. So uh, they think that it's a particular E. coli, but the mechanism is not known. Even the particular species is not known according to them. We know that uh, maybe there is some bacteria that uh, produces this phosphine, but what are the surrounding conditions that we need in order? So what are the starting in ingredients in order to produce phosphine? What do you need? Hydrogen and phosphorus. Life is actually very, very good. It almost looks like a sort of Lego set. And, and again, we don't know the mechanism. 
But if it's like a lot of other enzymes, then what it probably does is it assembles things together like hands assemble Legos. This is very much the way in which, for example, adenosine triphosphate is produced in a cell. You have adenosine diphosphate. That last phosphorus bond is very, very energetic. It's where a lot of energy is held within cells and is produced by ATP phosphatase, which basically just has this little rotor that has a proton gradient and that moves a little rotor and the rotor just snaps the molecules into place. And I would imagine that phosphine is being produced in a very similar sort of way. It's really amazing how life works mechanistically to form molecules. It's almost the way in which you imagine molecules to form when you're a kid and you have these ball and stick models. You just click them together. Life clicks them together. It's mm. different from abiotic processes where, the, where there are these more comprehensive sort of reactions where unnecessary bonds get broken and reform. You have all these intermediates. It's, it's a very different sort of system. And so what do we have here? We have a different... Uh... Uh, production pathways of uh, phosphine. I read that you can produce phosphine also in, within volcanoes. Yes, uh, in principle. In practice, not on Earth. Um, no? Not in any known volcanoes on Earth. Um, it might be interesting, this is a bit speculative, but it might be interesting to look on mud volcanoes, like in Azerbaijan. Those mud volcanoes produce a lot of methane, and so they're very reduced. Uh, and the reason that they end up producing the methane is probably because there's a lot of uh, decaying life that gets reprocessed and turned into the methane. But in most volcanoes, the constituents are carbon dioxide and water with some sulfur dioxide and sometimes elemental sulfur and hydrogen sulfide is about as reduced to, as you get. You need to become much, much more reduced than that to start producing phosphine. Also, um, uh, our geology is fairly phosphorus limited, so there's just not as much phosphorus to work with to begin with. Um, if you had a much more phosphorus rich uh, mantle that was degassing, it would have to be more reduced than as reduced as we imagine most of the early Earth uh, uh, magmas to be by about seven orders of magnitude. At that stage, you could start to really produce a lot of phosphine. There's some pretty good evidence from what little we know about uh, about the mineralogy on the surface of Venus, that it is not nearly sufficiently reduced. What are the other uh, production mechanisms you talk about, you, you, you yeah. hypothesized? So near the surface of Venus is very hot. So one of the things you could imagine is uh, maybe there's an equilibrium thermochemistry. Mm. So it's hot enough to just break bonds and reform them. So you can imagine kind of shuffling the atoms around and maybe some of those atoms end up looking like phosphine. This is in fact how phosphine is produced on Jupiter and Saturn, and it's a, it's a very abundant constituent. But it's very much like shuffling cards. Um, if you have a whole bunch of hydrogen cards around in your phosphorus card, and you shuffle it, it's very likely that your phosphorus card will be next to the hydrogen cards, and so you end up forming phosphine. On Venus, you have a lot more oxygen and not very much hydrogen. And so when you shuffle these, uh, these sorts of atomic cards, you end up with something that looks more like uh, phosphates or various other uh, uh, species with phosphorus bound to, to a bunch of oxygens. And so that's what we find from the thermochemistry. The amount of phosphine that's produced is very, very tiny. This is also the problem with lightning. Lightning's kind of like thermochemistry, but just at much That's high. another way. Yeah, it, it might produce some phosphine. It produces very, very little because it's done with the same mechanism, but just at higher temperatures. And then... Uh, and this lightning, where does it happen in the Venus atmosphere? That's a, another great question. So little is known about, um, about Venus. There are some radio observations. I'm not very familiar with them, but there are some radio observations that are indicative of uh, discharge processes. So there is indirect evidence of lightning on Venus. No one's seen any optical evidence for lightning on Venus yet. What would you use to detect uh, lightning in another planet? Well, I mean, you can use a light sense because it emits in... That's the, the best way to do right? it. Yeah. There, you, there you go. And that's the way that it's seen on Jupiter and Saturn. There are these beautiful images of lightning strikes. They happen within the water clouds of Jupiter and Saturn. If you get deep enough, there are these water clouds. And... Um, it's gorgeous. There are these enormous storms. The size of the lightning is much, much greater than the size of lightning on Earth. Venus, maybe there's storms that happen. They, they just happen deeper in, and so they're a little harder to see, and they might be more small scale. Um, or there may not be these kinds of storms that produce lightning at all. There's a bit of a chemical signature for it as well. Um, there are some of these noxes that um, uh, 
that have been seen in Venus's atmosphere. And the best explanation for the existence of these noxes is that the nitrogen, which is the second most abundant species in Venus's atmosphere, was dissociated. The only real way to dissociate that, um, at least deep within the atmosphere, is with lightning. You need a lot of energy to break that triple bond. And then it, it might as well bond with oxygen. And so you end up forming NO and NO2. So we didn't see any lightning with the, with the probes we sent to Venus? No. 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 You guys said also asteroid impact could be another option. Yeah, so this can produce phosphine in two different ways. Uh, one is it delivers reduced phosphorus species. There's this uh, mineral called schreibersite, um, which is a reduced phosphorus material. What we did was we calculated how much phosphorus would be delivered by just the interplanetary dust impinging on Venus. And we said, let's just imagine that every single atom of phosphorus was converted into phosphine. That was 10,000 times too little to explain the observations. The other way in which you can produce it is with a much larger impact, which has two effects. One is it does deliver some phosphorus, but the other thing is that it delivers a lot of iron, and the iron will reduce the phosphorus that's already present there. This actually could produce enough phosphine to explain the observations, but it would either be such a large impactor that uh, um, surface features would be seen. There, there has been surface map mapping. There are these infrared windows where you can see to the surface. Mm. And we should really see a crater there. And additionally, these events are so rare that you would only expect them happening once every million years or, or, or less. And the lifetime of phosphine is on the order of less than 1,000 years, more, more likely uh, around 100 years. And so you would have to have had that sort of event in the past 100 years, probably. And that's unlikely. And this calculation of uh, the phosphine lifetime is something you've done with your modeling, if yes. I understood well, in this graph. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> so we, we spoke about ways of producing phosphine. Yeah. And uh, we didn't talk about uh, the life uh, hypothesis yet. No. Well, I mean, we sort of discussed that. but. Uh, I wanted to know more about this graph. Can you explain me this thing? What was that? Yeah, so this is the output of a photochemical model. This photochemical model includes um, hundreds of species, thousands of reactions, which can be written out as these differential equations, which are solved numerically. And Do you want to explain what's a differential equation to the... YouTube public. Yeah, so in this context, I think it's best seen as rates. So there's a sort of um, rate at which something is forming or is destroyed. And this is written as um, a combination of the abundances of the reactants multiplied by a rate constant. It's how fast these reactants work together to form the products. And that equals the change in the amount of products over time. And that's the differential part of the differential equation. It's talking about a change in the amount of something over time. Okay. And uh, so what did you get from this uh, model? Yeah. So this model got a bunch of different things. Um, the sort of precursor is a slightly different picture than this one, which is typically called a spaghetti plot. And this shows all of the major constituents um, that have been observationally constrained within the atmosphere of Venus or all of the relevant ones that we could model with this particular model. Is it the one in the support? No. Yes, it's uh, uh, there. This one, that's, right? Yeah. That's the one. Well, that looks complicated. Well, it's complicated because there are a lot of different molecules. But what this is showing is that the changes in molecules as a function of atmospheric height predicted by the model match what we know. So this gives you some confidence about that the model is reproducing what's happening in Venus's atmosphere, at least reasonably accurately. It doesn't match everything. It doesn't do very well for water in the upper atmosphere, for example. What's the mixing ratio? So a mixing ratio is if you take all of the molecules per cubic centimeter of a particular species, uh, say SO2, sulfur dioxide, and then you divide that by all of the molecules in that cubic centimeter. That gives you what's called a volume mixing ratio, uh, or mixing ratio in this case for short. Okay. It's a way to talk about the fraction of the atmosphere that is whatever it is. So basically, what did you conclude from, uh, what can we conclude from this, uh, from this graph? From this graph? So this is something that was taken from the results of that model. And what this is figuring out is this is figuring out based on minor constituents in the atmosphere, 
as well as based on the temperature and pressure and what we know about how phosphine reacts, it figures out how long phosphine should be able to survive in that atmosphere. That's the blue line. And the red line is a more hypothetical graph that is plotting the, the formation based on just photochemistry. So there is a little bit of photochemistry that can form the phosphine. The rates at which this is done are fairly uncertain. They're very uncertain, especially uh, at the last stages. But ultimately, it takes something like PO2. It reacts that with hydrogen to form hydrogen bond with PO2. The oxygen is eventually abstracted away. So you get something like HPO. And eventually, you get HP and then H2P and H3P. There are a variety of pathways to that. There's a wonderful picture showing all of these different pathways. And that's how much it gets in terms of this is the rate of formation with the most favorable estimates, including the estimates of the unknown reactions. And then that's compared with the destruction. Um, and the formation and destruction can be balanced in two ways. The destruction rate that's shown in this picture is the destruction rate that's implied by the observation. So the more that you have of something, the faster it's going to be destroyed. And that's why formation and destruction look so different. If you make the formation and destruction fit in this particular plot, then you end up with something like the dotted line in the next picture, which shows the mixing ratio. And that dotted line shows how much you would expect with just the photochemistry, which as you can see is many orders of magnitude. This is a logarithmic plot. This one, right? Yeah. So this is a logarithmic plot. So it's, it's, it's many, many thousands um, of, of times lower than the amount that has been observed. So uh, that's how you end up reading this. This also importantly says how long you have to wait until your phosphine goes away. So if you just had, say, a source from an impactor or something, how long do you have to wait until it goes away? Well, you just take 10 to the minus 10 seconds to the minus 1, you invert that, and that works out to hundreds of years. So I'm interested in this uh, in this graph. So you plot this, this, the destruction at, uh, at certain altitude, right? Yes. How long it takes for phosphine to be destroyed. Yep. And now where you are on, on the surface, uh, it's going to be fast because it's very hot. I mean, yeah. phosphine is flammable. Uh, it's, uh... It is flammable on Earth because there's oxygen available. It is still destroyed at high temperatures near the surface of Venus. Um, and it's, it's destroyed by thermal dissociation. Uh, it just hits a third body hard enough that it knocks off one of the hydrogens and it's unlikely to find that hydrogen ever again. And then what happens here? I'm very curious about this... Uh... This feature here, yeah. what happens around the 20, 30 kilometers? So what happens there is um, at that particular atmospheric height, um, that's right below the clouds. So as the sulfuric acid from the clouds comes down, it ends up evaporating. It goes back into the vapor. And then it ends up uh, dissociating into SO3 and H2O. And then the SO3 ends up reacting with some of the sulfur that's available from, from the OCS. There's a whole series of reactions that happen, and that generates a lot of extra oxygen atoms, hydroxyl radicals, because you're introducing water. Um, and it also generates, uh, through reactions with the hydrochloric acid that's also present in Venus's atmosphere, it generates some free chlorine atoms. All of those end up destroying phosphine. And so when you get to the bottom of that cloud layer, it turns out that you are eating away a lot of that phosphine through the reactions with radicals. The dotted line ignores the amounts of radicals because the amounts of radicals are usually on the order of, say, a thousand molecules per cubic centimeter, which if that's all that was there would be better than most laboratory vacuums. It's a very small constituent and it's very uncertain. Every model gets a very different answer for that sort of curve. So we included the dotted line curve and we actually based our results on that dotted line curve um, because we didn't want the results to be too model dependent. It's more conservative to say it can only be destroyed by... Um, thermal dissociation and by photo dissociation, which are fairly well determined. That's what causes the dotted line to raise hey, right? up there. Yes. So when you get there, there are less clouds, so you get more UV light. Correct. Okay. And then the reason for the time scale in between those is because of diffusion. It would actually live a lot longer if uh, the atmosphere was not moving. You could actually have it survive for thousands of years if the atmosphere didn't move. But because the atmosphere is constantly circulating, it, uh, the, the phosphine gets circulated into regions where it does get destroyed. And so its lifetime is determined by its diffusion through the atmosphere. This is what's called eddy diffusion, which oftentimes is driven more by turbulent motions, so the small-scale motions in there. It's very, very slow in Venus's lower atmosphere. It's exceedingly slow. 
um, two orders of magnitude slower than on Earth, except in our cold trap. We 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 have one small region in our atmosphere that's that's very slow as well. So um, this is longer. This is shorter. This up here is shorter because of the UV light directly destroying phosphine. And the reason why this breaks off as well is the same reason why it breaks off here. So at the bottom of the clouds, you get these radicals and atoms. At the tops of the clouds, the photo dissociation doesn't just photo dissociate phosphine, it also photo dissociates SO2 to form SO and O. And that O goes on and destroys um, all of your phosphine. Okay, okay. Your model uh, basically is based on uh, what we know about Venus. But what do we actually know about Venus? I mean, do we know everything we need to know? Or there are so many parameters we don't know that those are just a guesswork. I mean, there's a lot how of how many oh. of these parameters that you put in your model are <laughs> guessed? A lot of them. <laughs> okay. I don't know the fraction. Um, for Venus, it's very difficult because there's a lot of important reactions that involve sulfur and chlorine, and both sulfur and chlorine. Chlorine chemistry is difficult to study, especially with hydrochloric acids and things. Sulfur chemistry is exceedingly difficult to study because sulfur reacts very, very differently from oxygen. Oftentimes it's seen as though oxygen is a sort of um, uh, analog to sulfur. And a lot of reactions are built by just looking at, um, say, CO2 reacts a certain way. Various other species may react a, diff a different sort of way. So you'd look at CS2, for example, as an analog for CO2. Uh, that's not usually very accurate. A lot of laboratory work needs to be done with sulfur chemistry. It's exceedingly difficult because sulfur is a lot more um, prolific in its reactions than oxygen. Oxygen likes staying at this state of minus two. It likes forming these two bonds. Sulfur can end up forming two bonds or four or six. There's a lot of different things that sulfur can end up doing. There's an incredible amount of uncertainty even in what's in the atmosphere of Venus because it's hard to see below the clouds. Um, and it's difficult to know what's, what the droplets are in fact made of. Uh, there's no real good measurements of that. Vega was able to see a little bit of what the clouds were made of possibly in one region. It's unlikely that the clouds are completely homogeneous. Um, the reason why we think they're primarily composed of sulfuric acid is entirely due to models with these uncertainties. We need to start measuring things in the atmosphere and we also need to start measuring things in the lab to really better understand what sort of chemistry can happen in these sorts of environments and what we should expect. So why we cannot do spectroscopy to understand what's in the atmosphere? Where is the difficulty? Well, the, the difficulty is you can only see so far. So even with the phosphine, um, it turns out that there's a continuum due to the clouds beyond which you can't see any deeper. And so the line against the continuum limits you to seeing only above 60 kilometers. The upper atmosphere of Venus is much better understood than the middle atmosphere and the lower atmosphere for this very reason. There are certain atmospheric windows which allow you to see deeper, and that's been done for water and for, uh, and for sulfuric acid and for sulfur dioxide. And uh, there's been some excellent work looking into the profiles of these species and coming up with what their concentration should be as deep as 35 kilometers from the surface or even 25 kilometers from the surface. They're still somewhat limited. They're often highly uncertain but they give us some very good constraints about how much of those species are below the clouds. But those can only be done for a handful of species and usually only the most abundant ones. So for sure we know way more about Mars than Venus. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Um, the fact that you can have a lander go there and that the lander isn't destroyed in a matter of days, um, if you're lucky. Although now we, uh, there are ways to build landers that could survive for potentially a month or more. On Venus? Yes. Um, but still, that's a very short amount of time compared to how long you can have a lander going around the surface of Mars. Um, Martian atmosphere, climate, history, much better understood. Mars is also better understood just because the surface is much, much older. Um, Venus's surface, there's some evidence that Venus has been completely resurfaced in the last 600 million years or so. And so we're very limited. Even if we did send a lander there, we would learn what Venus was like recently. We might learn about why it ended up like it was but we wouldn't know much about what it was like before. And uh, building a rover for Venus would be extremely difficult because, I mean, you need to have a, a way to cool it down, right? Yes. You basically have to send a refrigerator and uh, you have to keep it cool enough so that the instruments can work long enough to get results. And solar panels there are not going to work well because it's no. very cloudy, right? Yeah, there might be alternative ways to get energy, um, but those would be very, very difficult with... Uh, uh, standard rover technologies. 
And at the same time, I think the real limiting thing is you're near a surface which can melt lead and which destroys most electronics within a matter of minutes to hours if they're not shielded. And even if they are well shielded on, on, in a matter of days. Yeah. With future rover concepts, you might be able to get things that last for a month or more, which would be a considerable amount of time. And you'd learn so many interesting things from the surface. Um, but it is hard to sell that to a funding agency saying you can have a mission that lasts for a few years or a mission that lasts for a month if you're lucky. Uh, the most important graph shown in the in the paper is this one or the other one, I can't remember which one is it, uh, which is the one where you, it's basically a spectroscopic graph where you show an absorption line from phosphine that was measured uh, with those two telescopes. The thing I was curious about is that what's the excitation source for this uh, measurement or where does it come from? All right, so this is going to start also getting outside of my area of expertise pretty quickly because I am not the observer. So I know that this is the the uh, the zero to one transition. It's a rho vibrational mode of the phosphine. And the way in which it actually gets excited, it starts in its ground state. So it starts in the zero state and it ends up getting knocked in, into the one state, um, both from light from Venus itself and then also from reflected light from the sun. Both of those contribute a certain percentage. And when people look, they notice there's a little bit of light missing around one millimeter. It's an absorption feature. That's the reason it points down. So you aren't seeing the emission from, an, from excited phosphine. You are seeing the absorption of a certain fraction of solar light and Venusian light. I don't know what the fractions are because I wasn't the, the observer. Um, you are seeing the absorption feature as uh, the phosphine is knocked from that zero state into the one state. Are we sure that this measurement is uh, correct and this is not an artifact? Well, what you, did you do to to check that? You are looking at the best alternative candidate right now. That's actually what this plot is showing. Is uh, there is an SO two feature that uh, that would contribute to that line? It turns out it's an excited SO two feature. This one, right? Yep. Um, it's very, very difficult to get it to be deep enough, and it's not quite at the center either. It's a little off center. You need to be at a relatively high temperature to get the SO2 into the excited state so that it can get into a different excited state by another absorption. And the only way to do that, it tends only to be well populated at around 600 degrees um, uh, uh, Kelvin, 600 Kelvins. And uh, the clouds of Venus are much, much colder than that. So it's not a very well populated line. Okay. And that's the best candidate. Um, Clara Souza Silva and Hideo uh, Sagawa looked at um, hundreds of possible candidates and modeled them. This was the best one. It was about that uh, Clara's uh, paper about uh, phosphine as a biosignature. That was very interesting. It came out, when was that? It came out in, uh, in January. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, this is a very important paper because it suggests that, I mean, it shows that uh, Phosphine can be considered as a biosignature. And, and it's, it's a very powerful biosignature because in a lot of contexts, it really has no good alternative explanation. Your paper refers to this paper. And, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In a sense, you, you can see this as a sort of dialogue between two scientists, um, Clara Souza Silva and Jane Greaves. Um, although they, they came upon this independently, Clara Souza Silva, while she was working as part of Sarah Seeger's group, really looking into phosphine as a biosignature. Um, and then uh, Jane Greaves finding an old paper by Glyndeman pointing out that phosphine is produced by life and wondering if it might be on, on Venus. And then what this paper does is it really establishes a prediction for, for Venus if Venus had the microbes. And it turns out that that prediction is pretty well matched by the observations. That of course doesn't show anything in terms of whether there's actually life there, but it does show that if there was life there and it was a sort of phosphine producing life, then the signal that we see is what we would expect according to this paper. So if it is say 20, 30, 40 years from now established that there are microbes in the clouds of Venus, this will be really important because it's a really nice prediction before you saw it, then you see it, then you see the the evidence for it, and it has huge implications for exoplanets as well. It gives a lot of confidence into biosignature claims. So what this paper is saying is that we found phosphine. We don't know how this phosphine can be made uh, without uh, processing uh, processes that involve life. Yeah. So it could be life. But it could also be unknown chemistry. Unknown and chemistry, just, yeah. Just as I've been talking, there's we so much know. that's not known. 
And I will emphasize again, the best way to find out um, in the short term is by laboratory work and by certain ground-based observations in tandem. You can't do one without the other to really learn what's there. And so in a lab, you would try to produce phosphine using different uh, yeah. methods? Okay. Yeah. So the way that I would do it in the lab is I would start with some uh, droplets of concentrated uh, sulfuric acid with some water in an, anox in an anoxic environment with a lot of CO2 and SO2 around. I might even enhance the amount of SO2 to see some chemistry a little faster. And then I would add some phosphates in there, um, uh, which would pretty quickly become phosphoric acid. Um, and I would see whether I could get to phosphorus acid, which can disproportionate to form phosphine. I would see how this might work um, with the presence and the absence of UV light. I would see how this might happen with the presence of a sort of electron gun. I would actually see what would happen if I added salts or various other sort of uh, metallic components into the droplets, because we don't really know what the droplets are made out of. And so I would just play around with that sort of chemistry. But the other thing that you can do is you can explore acidophiles. They can't quite survive in concentrated sulfuric acid, but you can still try them in fairly acidic environments and see, are they more effective at producing phosphine or less effective at producing phosphine? And these are the sorts of directions that I would go with next in terms of uh, investigating this in the lab. And then the other thing that I would do is I would figure out what other things are being produced. Could they be seen spectroscopically? What does the spectroscopy really look like? And I would use those to inform the ground-based observations um, and make predictions for future observations. Yeah. Is there any plan to send probes to Venus now? Uh, there anything are... changed after <laughs> this paper? That remains to be seen. Um, I hope that things have changed. There are two proposed Venus missions through ESA right now. There are proposed missions that involve Venus um, and one involves putting a lander on the surface of Venus. And I think that those missions um, hopefully will have a bit of a better chance because of this. Um, there are no balloon missions currently under consideration. There are some missions considered by, by NASA. Those um, things. Yes. <laughs> I think that there's a lot of impetus so long as these results hold together. Um, there's a lot of impetus to actually send missions like this. They've, well, this makes sense because they're going to last longer, right? Oh, absolutely. They will struggle a little bit in sulfuric acid clouds, um, but they will last considerably longer. They don't get to see the surface, which is disappointing, but they would be able to look into the clouds and maybe even sample the clouds, figure out what the clouds are made of, and even figure out maybe uh, where the phosphine is coming from. But they can't do that realistically without the lab work and the observational work, because where do you look? The clouds are big. Do you look at a particular height? And what do you look for? And how many droplets do you need to collect? And how do you collect them? Uh, there are a lot of uh, unknown technological um, uh, developments that need to be made, and they need to be directed by what the laboratory work and what observations say uh, is the best place to look to answer this and other important questions about the constitution of Venus's clouds. Um, there have been proposed missions like this in the past. They've always been rejected. I think that this... The, the, the sort of balloons. Yeah. And, okay. I think that this is a good um, impetus for proposing a mission like this in the future. And uh, so do you think things are going to improve in terms of uh, inter interdisciplinary research funding now uh, after this uh, paper? Also very hard to say, but yeah. I'm hopeful that it will. Um, interdisciplinary work is exceedingly important. I mean... This paper really shows how successful interdisciplinary work can be. I'm funded by the Simons uh, Collaboration for the Origins of Life by the Simons Fa Foundation. And that collaboration is a wonderful interdisciplinary collaboration that involves molecular biologists, um, cell biologists, uh, biochemists, organic chemists, geologists, and astronomers, and atmospheric chemists. And all of these people work together to try to answer a common question. This paper is a sort of microcosm of that, in that you have astronomers, atmospheric chemists, uh, astrobiologists, um, all working together. And this is a very small subset. So there are a lot of other people, including a lot of people who've worked on phosphorus for a long time, and a lot of people who've worked on Venus a lot longer than we have, that can now weigh in on this, but only if they can receive the funding yeah. needed to do the experiments. Because when and I the spoke to Professor Didier Kelo, he said that uh, it's very hard to get funding. Because mm -hmm. let's say that you're doing a collaboration between two fields, you go and ask the founder for uh, one field, they ask you to go to the other field. Yep. 
Uh, so the Simons Foundation is a private uh, philanthropy yes. institute? Or? So it's funded by, uh, by contributions by Jim Simons. Jim Simons is a mathematician. Uh, he's famous for the Chern-Simons uh, theorem, which is connected to, to string theory in ways I don't understand. Um, after he did this sort of work in pure mathematics, he got interested in how to predict stock market. And it turns out he was very good at it and became a billionaire. And uh, he started funding lots of things, including uh, paying for people to, uh, to teach mathematics to high schoolers, um, autism research, pure mathematics research, a lot of machine learning. And then also he has various collaborations, including this collaboration on Origins of Life. And there is also another one, the Breakthrough Initiative as well. I heard that uh, they are interested in uh, putting some money for uh, the Venus, uh, some Venus mission, yes. sending a probe there. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what the money will be used for. I'm hopeful that some of the money will be used for the laboratory work that the Seeker Group is capable of doing. Uh, I think that that's the most important first so step. So these are the guys that want to send the probe to Alpha Centauri, right? Yeah, so this is Yuri Milner. Um, I think that this is a wonderful blue skies sort of project to work on because even if it fails, you're going to learn so much about future technology with it. Um, and it's important, I think, to have a broad vision and look toward the stars. And this is a perfect sort of thing to do that. I think that there are some great things also to do a little closer to home. Solar flares. So we discussed solar flares. I mean, we spoke about solar flares. You said solar flares in certain planets um, orbiting certain types of stars might be a condition necessary for the emergence of life. Yeah. Life. But when do they become dangerous? And uh, is it a problem for us? <laughs> for us is a very different question than for starting life. Uh, the real problem that they pose for starting life is more on these low mass stars, these... Uh, these ultra cool stars like Trappist, which has uh, seven planets, three possibly within the habitable zone. Um, it's much, much closer to its host star. And so it's much more affected by these flares and the stars tend to be exceedingly active. The energy of the flares is much higher compared to the quiescent energy, the energy when it's quiet compared to the sun, which is a relatively quiet star. This is really good, potentially, especially when they're young. When they're young, they're more active, just like us. And um, uh, uh, this is really good for starting life if you have an atmosphere, but it's really good for removing an atmosphere. And so it's still an open question as to whether there's a nice window yeah. where it flares enough so that um, you can do this amazing chemistry, but it doesn't flare so much that it strips you of the atmosphere, or uh, it can also just strip the atmosphere of its hydrogen, uh, which is a big problem because then you actually end up stripping all of your oceans and you are left with an O2 rich atmosphere. Oxygen is wonderful for us, but it's terrible for prebiotic chemistry and it's poisonous for almost all early life. Because we had the bad flares, solar flares in the past and one mm -hmm. of them was the Carrington event. Oh yeah. I heard that you could actually work with some of the telegraphs days after. Yeah? Yeah, they, okay. they would still function off of the electric energy. That was, uh, oh. yeah, so, yeah, you didn't need to supply them with any energy. They just had that energy contained. There is some projections that if something like that happened now, um, it would destroy many of our satellites and it would throw us almost into a sort of temporary pre-industrial age. Um, I don't know exactly how realistic that is, but it is something to consider. And it's nice to compare with these ultra-cool stars. So some of these ultra-cool stars, even the quiet ones, We'll have Carrington level events uh, multiple times a week. Are you prepping yourself? Are you a prepper? <laughs> you know that guy. So. Oh, yes. So, no. Um, I've done sensible preparations in the sense of uh, I have enough food for, to feed our family for a couple months and enough water to keep us well hydrated for a couple months. Probably not so essential for Cambridge, but uh, still, that's the sort of store that we have. Um, if things get serious beyond that, then then I'm screwed. If you want to prepare yourself for a solar flare, you would need a Faraday cage, basically. Yeah, so if you wanted to protect your own e electronics, although that's fairly ineffective because everything's networked right now, if you didn't have the internet, how useful is your computer really? Um, you connect with the other preppers. Yes. You make a new internet. We could make a dark web that was yeah. specially shielded. <laughs> we could start launch launching our own satellites through a private company uh, yeah. with Faraday cages around them. And... Uh, yeah, see how that works. <laughs> yeah.
you look into alien stories? I mean, are you into these things? or I'm not very into these things. I do happen to know a little bit about ancient aliens because it was on Netflix. And my son, Henry, is really interested in ancient Egypt. Okay. And he found out, oh, this is a documentary about ancient Egypt. He started watching it. And uh, pretty quickly, we found out that this is, this is not what I would call a documentary about ancient Egypt. It was very imaginative, though. But the thing that was most shocking to me, which brings us almost full circle, is that one of the people that they interviewed on this documentary for Ancient Aliens, which included the, uh, the meme that you showed. Giorgio, oh, what's his name? Tsoukalos. Yes. Tsoukalos, yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. Um, one of the other people that they interviewed was a young Sarah Seeger. Huh? She appears in those documentaries. She says very sensible things, and then they interview someone else who takes those sensible things and mangles them. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, I was very surprised to see her in those documentaries when I was watching them with my son. And because of that, actually, I did end up watching all the documentaries. Not with my son. I didn't want him to, to I didn't want his head to be, to be filled with, with so much nonsense. But uh, I myself enjoyed watching them. It's entertaining. I mean, there's oh, a lot of really science is. fiction, but... Uh... Yeah, it's very imaginative. I think that this is the sort of thing that all scientists have to balance. It's good to have a very active imagination, but it's also good to be skeptical. And there are some scientists that are too imaginative and they end up going off the deep end and they end up believing things that they really don't have sufficient evidence for. But there's also the risk that you become too skeptical. You dismiss everything and then you can't possibly do anything. Yeah. You even doubt about yourself. Exactly. You can start to become a solipsist. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and actually, I think that you see both of these in conspiracy theories. You'll see conspiracy theorists believe all these wild things, but then you'll see other conspiracy theorists who are skeptical about whether the earth is flat or round because uh, it looks flat to them outside their window, um, but they don't accept any of the other evidence. So some of them are extreme believers and very imaginative, and some of them are just extreme skeptics with no imagination at all, and they get to a very similar place. I had a chat with uh, Michael Shermer, who is a skeptic, uh, the president of the Skeptic Society yeah. in the U.S., I used to read his articles when I got Scientific American. Yeah. So yeah. He's got back huge when I was in high school. Of, yeah. Uh, articles. These are his books. This is his book. I used to read his book, uh, "Why Do People Believe Strange Things?" Yeah. When I was in high school, um, that was a really influential okay. book in helping me to think about extraordinary claims. Yeah. yeah. So I want to show you the the video. So basically, these videos were released by uh, Pentagon. Uh, they were released by. A guy that used to work uh, in some government agency uh, oh, neat. called uh, Louis Elizondo. Okay. And uh, one of them was taken in 2004 and the other two in 2014, 2015. They show something weird. <laughs> oh. Sorry. That's okay. I'll put this back on. Okay. That's better. Anyway, there are another two videos of okay. this uh, type. And uh, basically, so we spoke about these things with Michael Shermer. They've, they've, they've been confirmed that they are uh, original okay. uh, by the government. I'll trust you about that. Uh, but they don't know what it is. Sure. But then people say, well, these are uh, aliens. Okay. So... <laughs> <laughs> I'd be interested in what Michael has to say about that. Um, my own attitude is uh, we had comparatively a fairly mundane discovery in our paper. We discovered something really neat, but it's not intelligent life visiting Earth. We tried to keep this a secret for one week and failed utterly. It's very hard for me to imagine that the government, or just human beings in general, would be so efficient at keeping a secret. I also, in a sense, I would say that I respect conspiracy theory when there's evidence for conspiracy theory. And I could kind of imagine that the government might do things like this because they are, in fact, working at, say, a nice stealth craft. Someone got a good picture of the stealth craft. They don't want to admit that they're working on the stealth craft. And so they share this stuff. They make it sound mysterious. They're going to tell, these are aliens, these are uh, alien spacecraft. They won't even say that it's aliens. They just say, look at this weird thing. And yeah. they know what people will, will do with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they don't comment on it further. And there's this huge disinformation. I mean, Russia does the same thing with people's political stuff on the internet. This is the sort of conspiracy that I would buy a lot more than intelligent alien yeah. life visiting Visiting Earth. We discussed this thing with Michael. Um, in fact, there were uh, there were guys tasked to feed uh, false information to 
Okay. UFO researchers and UFO believers, and they would go. <laughs> and, uh, well, then they're partially yeah. to blame for what we've ended up with. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, that that doesn't surprise me nearly as much as intelligent alien life would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Paul, thank you very much. And it's been welcome. a pleasure. Hopefully yeah. we can do this again another time, maybe with some new discovery. Hopefully. Absolutely. It, it'd be a delight to talk with you okay. again at some point in time in the future. Thanks. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much.